Here we go, Tim. Season five, episode one. We're talking all programming this season. Um, today we're talking goal setting. Mm -hmm. So we all know goals are important. So yeah. how do we set the right goals for the right people at the right time? Yeah. So two listeners here, there's one that works in the team setting and there's one that works in more of a personal training one-on-one -on -one setting. I'm going to go in two different directions with this and I'm going to focus on the team setting to begin with. And then we're going to tail off and go into more one-on-one -on -one setting. Now in the team setting, there's a certain sense, there's a law of averages we're going to apply when we're going to goal setting, right? If you're going to create individual goals for every single person on a large team, let's say like football of 110 guys in the college level and 70 guys in the NFL level, unless you have unlimited resources, it's going to be really hard to accommodate that everyone. And it gets a lot of pressure on the coach, right? That element of you always want to do what's best and you always want to push yourself to provide the highest quality training experience for your athletes every single time you have the opportunity to work with them. But then it comes at the other end of the spectrum of you don't really have enough time in the day to do a custom plan and write a very nuanced training goal. And one thing that I think is often misunderstood is that the customization is offset by the environment we create. And what I mean by that is we can get away with a lot more, a lot less customization by just having a lot of external motivators in that group environment, as long as you're good at leveraging that in a compelling and interesting way. But when we're looking at the goal setting, there's probably a really good model you should be thinking about is this idea of a pre-mortem that we look at if we were going to lay out a plan towards accomplishing an outcome, let's say we want to win our conference championship, or we want to have X amount of them or guys go to the NBA or the NFL or major league baseball or NHL or whatever, right? Or maybe there's another goal of, we just want to be as, as technically sound and resilient as possible. And that can mean a couple of things, right? So there's a, there's a outcome goal that we're looking at it from. We want to win a championship or go to the NFL. Then there is a process goal of, we want to be really good about being resilient, practicing every day we possibly can to the highest level we can do every single time we're on the field that we're as prepared as humanly possible to be out there and co compete at the highest level. Then we get into this, like, what is the. What's the difference, right? We can look at a couple different other models, like looking at KPIs or key performance indicators that give us benchmarks as we want to go towards that progress. Are we making progress or not? Objectives and key results referred to as OKRs. And then that gets into this dynamic of what's the objective and what are the key results we need to do. They kind of blend a lot. They kind of get fluid when we talk about conversations. I've been victim of this myself of saying, you know, what's your OKR, KPI, primary goal, secondary goal, outcome goal, process goal. Like there's a lot of like, I guess, gray or blending of all of these different things. And mm -hmm. one could argue that could make it confusing for the user or the listener. So speaking firsthand and pre-mortem is the other one. It's this notion of like, when we're getting into these goals and we're talking about what we can do from a value perspective for our athletes in a group environment, it's important to have this, hey, this is ultimately what we want to accomplish. And here are the things that are absolutely necessary to accomplishing. And we all have to agree upon it. We all have to be in that mutual state of belief that the necessary components to reach an outcome is in front of us. And if we just do these things in this sequential order or this sequence, that we're going to get to that outcome in the most efficient, linear way possible. Then for personal experience, there is a conversation around in a group environment, that pressure, that that motivator, that opportunity to do a pre-mortem, which is simply looking ahead to here's what we want to accomplish. And here will be the bottlenecks or the limiting factors to accomplishing that. So how do we create plans or attack that problem before it is a problem? It's just being aware of the limitations we have. And that is an empowering thing for a group. And one message I would give to you as a coach, if you are going to utilize this exercise is be willing to have this counter and be willing to let people, specifically the athletes, discuss what they feel is of value. And they're going to be very telling on what they think the shortcoming of our program is as strength conditioning coaches. We don't do enough of X, Y, and Z. That focus too much on this, which all very likely could be true. That's a tough thing when you're breaking down your, your goal setting and it becomes maybe a potential, you might feel attacked, right? And that's that turns into that quite easily. And especially if you are rigid and not open to suggestion and difficult to work with, 
and then you have an open forum, it becomes a kangaroo court and you're the primary uh, defendant. And I think that's a, I think that's something to be conscious of. And it could go into this other level. Maybe you go into pods and collectives and you say, okay, what is our, what's the running back group want to accomplish this off season? What's the wide receiver group want to accomplish this off season? Maybe you do individual mi meetings within clusters of like, hey, our coaches are going to break off, take the offensive defense, and we're going to go down with these guys one by one and try to learn what makes them tick, what makes them motivated, what do they want to accomplish, setting some actionable items they can do along the way. And what becomes so apparent and obvious is when you have these conversations with transition coaches, and again, I'm right there with you, like I've been in that situation, is this... Do we have that much time to inventory and set goals and work through this? And I've sat down individually with every player and go, okay, that might've been futile because it didn't really have an impact on my programming. It's on me. And then we might sit down as a group and it just turns into, it just gets off the rails of nothing related to actual goal setting. It just becomes an attack on all the things that you are or aren't doing. And what I would be very, very honest about in all this is it's worth the time, but you got to look at it just like you look at training is you got to be prepared and you got to be willing to control the narrative and control that conversation. I shouldn't say narrative because that makes it seem like you're shifting their goals onto what your agenda is. But what I mean by that is you're controlling the flow and the organization of that actual interview and asking, probing and leading questions is important in a one-on-one -on -one setting. It's probably dangerous in a group setting. If I'm asking open-ended questions where people can just kind of open for interpretation their answer and then go in a bunch of different ways and it turns into an all-out back and forth and it sounds like Parliament and, and England pre-Circa Day World War II and Winston Churchill's just sitting there waiting for his time to go up there and save the United Kingdom. Like, it could be like that. Yeah. Now, you don't let it control. Hopefully that picture is resonating because I've been in that and you're just basically the, the prime minister just getting just absolutely destroyed from a lack of control of the meeting. But with all that being said, is if you look at that goal setting period is important and we are good at what we emphasize no matter what level you are at and what focal what focal point you may have is when i go into that goal setting it's going to be a transformative experience not just for me to understand how can i help and serve my athletes but also for my athletes to feel like they have an open forum and open up op an opportunity to have dialogue about how they want to set this up and that it becomes mission critical it becomes so important and and you might be listening to the strength because you're like, I don't got time. I don't got time. I don't got time. You're right. You don't. But do you have time to not know what your athletes want to accomplish? And do you have time to not know what you're working with? No, you don't. Because you're going to spend a lot of more time trying to figure out what you can learn in a very short, brief period of time. If as long as you're efficient and organized, break it up. I have 10 minute meetings with each one of your players. It's just that op open forum where they have an opportunity to be heard and, and create some sort of diagnostic of how they can leverage this off season. And then when it gets down to the actual point of making a bigger impact, like the, the famous line from Abraham Lincoln, I got six hours to cut down a tree. I'm going to spend the first four sharpening my ax. That's what this is. That's understanding what makes your athletes tick, what they value, what they want to accomplish. And when you get to that thing that they need to do, but they know they, you know, we all know collectively they don't want to do, you can hold them to that standard. And it gets into these conversations of like, I want to be faster. Or I want to be able to go through a season without getting hurt. And they're going to have to do the things that they don't necessarily want to do because a lot of times things that happen to us are a product of what we don't like doing and avoid doing in the first place. Like I want to lose weight, but I don't want to do cardio or I don't want to eat less. That's where a coach comes in. Mm -hmm. You told me you want to lose weight and these are necessary. Unfortunately, there's no real shortcut around it. You got to put in the work. And when you're in as a coach and you had a discourse about it and you tell them, hey, I'm not using, using this against you. I'm not holding you hostage to the things you told me in private. What I am doing is trying to hold you to the standard in which you know you need me to hold you at. So when we get to that critical threshold that we know we need to get to, that you are accepting of the coaching I'm about to give you. And that is a, a matter of trust and rapport and not taking this as, as a opportunity to damage that relationship for maybe some ulterior motives. But with that going into it, what also goes into it is certain timelines and timelines are scary, man. Like. I mean, if I set a goal of like, hey, writing a thousand pages in three months for a novel that I'm trying to write, that means I got to write a thousand pages. That's a lot. Yeah. 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 You know, I'm like, that's essentially what we're asking to do when we start to create goals and benchmarks or KPIs and OKRs or doing a pre-mortem is we're giving ourselves things that we actually have to accomplish. And pressure is privilege. Like the, 
setting an expectation of getting to something based off a conversation of what you know is necessary is daunting and intimidating, but it's necessary. It's absolutely necessary. And when I look at that window that I have with my athletes to have a rapport about what we need to do, and then, all right, like we're getting to crunch time here and every day we have is a gift. So I'm not going to hemorrhage that doing a lot of fluff type of things that I'm going to zero in on what's necessary. And I'm going to push them to that point of discomfort. There's no such thing as an easy day. There's only necessary days and we're moving net closer every single time we're doing it to a preconceived benchmark. And when we have to get off track, we're going to get right back on track faster. That is the secret here. That's the message. And when you look at all that stuff collectively and you're looking at your team and, I, and I'm going to pause for a second, I will get into more of a one-on-one -on -one nuanced conversation. You, you have to have some sort of uh, control and some sort of, some sort of a level of you're the manager of this goal setting period from a time, from an efficiency standpoint, because if you're just hemorrhaging time, talking about what you want to accomplish and not doing the things necessary to accomplishing those things, you're never going to accomplish them in the first place. So having, having some sort of carpet mentalization of this is goal setting period. Here's our objective for this goal. Here's how we want to organize this and structure this. Here's where we're looking to get out of this necessary information to write a more robust more specific program to the needs of our athletes based off of an interview and conversation we had together. And then we could put the work in to get into that. And we'll get to that critical juncture. If here's benchmark one, or here's key result one, here's what we should be hitting in this time period. Did we, or did we not? What we could have done better? How do we debrief and improve? And then you go on to the next OKR or the key result and you keep working it, keep working, keep working. And then there the off season, we review. Mm -hmm. Did we or did we not meet that objective or did we not meet that overall KPI or did we not reach our primary or outcome oriented goal? And if not, was it a quality or was it a hypothesis question? Right. And I talk about this extensively all over the place. So every time I go talk somewhere, I'm talking about all of it is just an expansive research design and we're getting to that outcome and we have to evaluate was a hypothesis of our training decisions that we made correct or was a quality control in which we trained or the quality in which we trained the limiting factor. And there should be congruence with what your athletes want and what they expect. And there should be some sort of synergy. It should look, feel, and smell like the things that we need to do, relatively speaking to that outcome, outcome or primary goal, or looking at it from an objective or a KPI. Yeah. And those conversations are hard. I actually had a similar conversation with the group today. And like, they looked at me like, I just kicked their puppy. It's like, guys, this isn't a bad thing, but we got to have this conversation so we can get to where we're trying to go. As far as team versus one-on-one -on -one setting, would you say the one-on-one -on -one setting is a little easier or is it just different in your opinion? Oh, uh, yeah, I would, I'm not going to say it's probably harder in my opinion, probably okay. from an experiential standpoint. Because the expectation is when you're one-on-one, -on -one, they know what they want to accomplish mm -hmm. as a coach, right? They paid you for a service and they might've paid a higher amount to have a faster timeline or more specific program. And that means that they should probably have a very specific thing they want to accomplish, but rarely does that happen, right? It, it, it just doesn't happen. And I'm not trying to sit there and say that there's not people out there that have a very dialed in specific goal. And the ironic part is when you do get that, I mean, I'm just as much to blame as everyone else is I try to talk them out of it because I don't think it's relevant to relative importance. So for instance, a guy comes to me and pay you a certain amount of money over a certain period of time to help me squat 400 pounds. Like that's not as important or significant as you might yeah. think. It is. Mm -hmm. However, like as a coach, you have to almost be able to discern between like, it doesn't really matter what your goal is. It's their goal. It's important to them. And if they're willing to pay you and give you the time, you have to do it in a safe and effective manner. You don't do reckless things. Like you don't have to right. like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to basically teach you bad technique and get there any way necessary. Your goal is to try to set realistic expectations and get them to that, get them the outcome that they want. But more times than not, and this is why I think it is harder is because that's rare that they actually do know what they want to accomplish and they're trying to get you to create their goal for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that becomes an issue, a conflict of interest, because you are essentially going to propel on them, whatever agenda or bias you have. And that's, that's sometimes tough, right? And 
they start to reconcile with the fact that, oh, wow, this actually was never actually my goal. I just didn't have one. And I maybe preemptively set up my training without really consciously thinking about what I wanted to get from this and what is the outcome. Like if I go see a auto body, auto body shop and I bring them my car, there's a specific thing wrong and they fix nothing but the thing that was actually wrong, I'm going to be upset. But I don't know what's wrong with my car, so I have to rely on them to do a diagnostic and give me some sort of input. And I think that's kind of the expectation when we look at training. Like, I don't know what's wrong. Well, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do with that car? Do you want to just get to work? Do you want to bring it over to uh, a drag race? Do you want it to be able to look good and while you're driving on the strand? Like, well, what do you want with this car? What's the point of it? That has a big impact on what that mechanic should or shouldn't do. And you might be able to put thousands of dollars into certain aspects and, you know, like at a really expensive engine and alternator and all this stuff in that car, but it's not going to drag race. It's just driving me to and from work. I want it to be efficient. I want to be able to park it. I don't have to worry about it. I want to keep low maintenance. Okay. Well then we don't need to do high performance things on it. And the same thing with training. You know, you come to me and you're like, all right, I'm a world-class trainer. I'm one of the best in the world. I'm in the 99th percentile. I can do amazing things with some people who have a credible ability and skill. So if you're just a gen pop person that comes to me with the expectation, that I'm just going to kind of like get you doing these things that are provocative and nuanced without a conversation about what you really want and what's necessary for you based off of where you're starting and what you want to accomplish and the timeline you want to accomplish, then there's a huge disconnect of that. And if I'm kind of left to this, like on my own device, and I don't necessarily think that you have anything really tangible you want to accomplish. I just want to be able to execute on a daily basis with a good training plan. It might be pretty generic and not that much dissimilar to what I'm doing in a group environment. So that, that reason why it's harder to based off your original question is because you have to come prepared to ask very leading and probing questions that get that person talking. And eventually they have to start to say, you start to pick up on patterns. You start to pick up on hot button things that they're repeating over and over again. Like, I just got to lose weight. You know, like, I mean, I'm just struggling struggling with my kids. I can't keep up with them. Or I just don't like the way I feel, you know, they're just repeating over and over and over again. Like, well, what would be a goal? Like, I don't know. I don't really have any, like you do, you do. You told me five times already it's lose weight. Yeah. But you know, and what they're trying not to do is limit what they think they want to do. Right. Because if you break down weight loss, it's not sexy. It's energy expenditure and energy intake. It's a 24 hour, yeah. seven day a week job. And like, I want to lose 30 pounds in six weeks. Like, Okay. That means you need to be 30 times 300 or 3,500 in a deficit over the course of six weeks from an expenditure and intake standpoint, whatever that math works out to. Right. That's, that's mechanically what it breaks down to. Right. And you can break down knee and BMR and all sorts of stuff. But look, calorie, a pound is 3,500 calories. Like that's a hard number to realize, right? Like being in a, what, what's that, a 90,000 calorie deficit over the course of six weeks. It's a lot of calories, a lot. And having an honest conversation about that with maybe a 10 pound weight loss in, in six weeks might be more realistic and safer and more sustainable. But with that being said is like, if you do want to go 30 pounds in six weeks, it's going to take probably four to six training sessions a week. You're going to probably have to invest more into nutritional support and supplementation. Are you interested in doing that? Yes or no. And if they're like, ah, that's not a little bit more than they want. Okay, well, have to temper your expectations here a little bit. And a lot of times I could be talking them out of their goals or perceived as that way, but it's not. It's your timeline and your expectations and what you're willing to invest are incongruent and no one's going to be able to do that. It would be a lie to say that. And I don't want to lose your business or opportunity because I think you're better served with me than anyone else. But I would say this, if I tell you something that's just unrealistic or unattainable, but I, I and say that you can do that, probably going to be at the expense of maybe your health, maybe coming at the expense of your long-term results and your ability to be sustainable. Therefore, after it could be just quite frankly, reckless and dangerous to do that in order to get someone's business. It's, it's a, a clear sign of negligence as a, as a proprietor of health and fitness. With that being said is more times than not as a strength conditioning coach, we worked really hard. You can see all the books behind me, you know, all the courses I've went to, you know, I teach and do stuff. I have a certain level of ego and have an understanding of what is necessary before I even meet you. And I formulate my own conclusion based off of seeing a redundancy. And I just said, like, I know you're how to lose 
30 pounds in six weeks. And I would break it up into, all right, systematically lowering your calories, increasing your expenditure, focusing on density and frequency. I don't know if that's going to work for you until I get to know you and what makes you tick and what makes it, makes you work and operate, what your exercise selection should be from a movement assessment, what your level of variables and frequency I need to do from a physiology assessment. And then from a psychological aspect, what you, what, when we get to that point where you need to be pushed, what is your response to that? And all that being considered is when you have that opportunity to interview someone and do a consultation and you can get them going on what it is they want, asking leading and probing questions to keep them talking. If we're looking at a, a interview for goals for a prime, for a private client, it's about getting them talking 80% of the time that you're meeting with them and you're listening and I'm trying to observe patterns. Because when you get done with that 60 minute eval and you're going through all these questions and finding all these things, whether you go that long or not, you're, if you don't get them talking the majority of the time, you're not actively listening, you're probably going to miss the one thing that they actually want to accomplish. And you could, you get better asking questions. Like at the end of this, if you were going to finish, what would be your expectation and what would you actually look to get a refund for if you didn't get what? And if they say, nah, if I didn't lose that 10 pounds, I'd probably look to get a refund. Or if I got hurt, or if I don't hit that 405 number, I'm like, okay. Like they're very, tell you very clearly what their expectations are. And again, going back into that, going to that goal setting with the team set, like you're going to have to hold yourself to a standard of reaching something. And that's scary. Like that's, that's hard. Cause what you, you get a very clear picture is people are wildly consistent and our value prop to a client that potentially wants to work with us, if they can't or won't, that's what we do. We work with people who can't either do an exercise or do the variables associated with that. So they don't have the prerequisite body biomechanics or physiology to handle a strength training program. We have to find a way to get them to be able to do that or they won't. They don't have the psychological makeup to stay disciplined and consistent enough to actually reach some sort of outcome. And you fit in by figuring out a strategy that can be successful with from biomechanics and physiology perspective and from a psychological expect expectation from a coaching and giving them enough, enough support where they feel like they can do it. And when you're breaking that down and looking at it from your value prop is to those who can or won't, you have to figure out what they can't do and why they won't do it. And then from there. You start to triangulate all of the things like exercise selection variables and what type of coach you need to be to help that person reach that goal. Cause a good coach is malleable to a, a, an ever changing list of demands from your clients. And they're pretty generic. I usually classify them into what I call archetypes of people who are coming to me from a rehab rehabilitation setting, usually just want to feel better and not be in pain or don't get re-injured. Or if they're coming to me from a a fitness type of perspective of either gaining weight or losing weight, more specifically losing fat or gaining muscle, I can put them into that camp. Then you have like what I call just kind of the, the generals of the, they just don't really care. They just want a place to occupy space and time and, and be in a great environment with good customer service and good consistency, getting a little bit better, but not necessarily want to accomplish anything tangible. And that might be a little bit more slow play of getting to actually to the root of what they want, but when you classify them or cluster them into these subgroups, there's a danger in that because you can potentially start to typecast what they're going to do based off of what you think their psychological makeup is. Like the reason why they can't lose weight is because they lack psychological discipline. They can be very disciplined, just struggled, but they may not know what to do. Or if they're like a person that you just can't go faster, my association with, they probably aren't a very good mover. And they start to gravitate to things that they're already inherently good at, but that could be wrong. Like it could be a completely wrong assumption. And when you're going through these probing and leading questions, being an active listener, there's a concept of motivational interviewing where essentially you're just giving them more opportunities to come to their own conclusion and supporting them in that path. Like, so it sounds to me like you, like if I understand what you're saying correctly, you want to lose weight because you think that will help you be a better father to your kids. Does that sound fair? Yes. And what being a better father to your kids will give you more confidence with your marriage and at work. Does that sound right? And the things that haven't worked have been falling down to, it's just been a hard time staying consistent with a workout regimen based off how busy you are with work and family. Does that sound accurate? Yeah. 
so that you, you just learn how to repeat and push them in that direction and you further probe and get them into this notion of they're forming their own conclusions and they're making it subconscious what they need to do. So we're in that critical threshold of Thursday, I'm tired, got the kids from baseball practice. I don't want to get a workout in tonight at 6 p.m. You got to do it. You committed, you made the plan. Toughen up, buttercup, get it done. You know, that's, that's the difference. So back to the original question you had, goal setting wise, it's, I think it's harder. I'm, it's just, it's more personal, right? Hence personal training. It's a lot more, it's a lot more invasive from a coach and a client. And I'm hopefully saying that in a way that doesn't come off as like gross, but like it is, it's, it's everyone's more exposed. Everyone is a lot more transparent, a lot more their guards down. Like they're essentially more in a vulnerable state from you have a higher expectation from me and I have a higher requirement. And in a lot of times in team setting, I can be compelling and I can be bombastic and I can be really assertive and I can overcome a lot of like individual conversations that I would like to have with just setting up a great environment. You can't do that. You can't hide in one-on-one. -on -one. You just can't. You really like, you don't have that luxury of going to another person in the group and screaming at the top of your lungs for an hour. As far as, I know we're going to talk evaluations uh, in another episode specifically, we'll go deep on that. But do you ever use evaluations either in the team study or one-on-ones to sort of guide that conversation or do you save that for later? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so I don't lose the sale. You know, like, you know, like don't lose the sale. So if you're like, I don't want to sit down for a 30 minute conversation, don't lose it. You know, like figure out a way to integrate that, but still you got to work to get those answers or get those questions answered. Because if you don't, you're going to be flying blind. So in a one-on-one -on -one setting, like any good personal trainer will tell you that as they're building up their roster, they're finding ways to integrate questions into those evaluations. In a more established roster, like you get a little bit more luxury of like being patient and pragmatic with it. Like I'm not going to go through a training program until you sit down for a 60 minute console and I'm going to charge you for that. And, and we all have that decision to make at any given moment. Maybe you just, maybe you feel that your opportunity to serve is to get to meet and sit down with as many people as possible and talk about that with them. So all that being considered, like, yeah, if you're. If you're you know, bifurcating your evaluation in an interview, like you might actually be limiting the number of people you can work with in a group setting. Yeah. I mean, training is testing. I, I, I talk about that quite a bit, that there's a, there's a lot of blending of the pre-testing and ongoing testing. So if you, you know, look at everything you do as potentially an assessment, you know, there's a argument to be made about not necessarily bifurcating it there as well. But there's another conversation around of are people really as forthcoming with the information you need to know in, in every environment. And I, I think we know, I think we know intuitively. I don't think you need to me to cite any research to realize that people are drastically different in a one-on-one -on -one interview or a more personal situation than they are in a group. Like we, we default to the, the vibe of the group and we see this time and time again. So showing any bit of weakness, especially in a male sport like football, you know, being vulnerable is weakness. And that, that is construed as someone that might be a liability when it comes down to a very critical, critical situation in a football game. And it's not true, like for the record, but it's hard to fight that psychology when you're in a group setting and you're trying to ask like, what makes you tick? What, what, what how do you want me to coach you? What, what, what values do you have? You know, what, what were some of the things that you had to deal with with your parents that you liked or disliked? What coaches did you like or dislike? And why? It, when we get to that point of, we know it's going to be hard. Do you want me to give you a heads up? Or do you want me to just essentially just be, be very like withholding of that information and then get you to dump a bunch of adrenaline to your system and rise to the occasion? Like I get such interesting answers when you have these very specific questions. I mean, I could tell you when I was at army, I asked everyone in the room, who has a motivation to play in the NFL? Zero people raise their hand and like, okay, well, you know, that was going to lead into this next thing of like, we got to yeah. do absolutely necessary, Whoops. you know, like <laughs> and at USC, a hundred percent of the group raised their right. hand. So it's like that worked one place did not work the other place. Like, okay, well, we, you know, what values do you guys have? And then you get to sit down like with each one of those guys, like, actually, I do have motivation to play in the NFL. I just don't like to talk about in the group because it makes it seem like I'm going to defer from my for my service. And that's actually looked down upon. I'm like, oh, okay, well, 
I'm glad I asked you one-on-one -on -one what that was, because, you know, it, it seems logical that everyone here would like to play in the NFL and make a lot of money if they're playing college football, but in a group setting, in a military academy, where if you say things like that, it actually might feel like you're, you're showing ulterior motives from what you should have in terms of serving your country and, and doing what you should be doing to protect America, which it's hard to process that when you're like, ah, let's have a goal time, you know, like, so, but you know, with all that being said is like, there's, there's seamlessly integrated assessments that may or may not be need to be disclosed beforehand. Like, a, you know, I'm just evaluating as I go, like we might be doing sprints and I'm timing them with a stopwatch or recording that that's a test, or, you know, I might be doing VBT on a eight RM and that's the, the velocity drop off from one next, like actually is a, is a force velocity profiling, or I might be doing a corrective strategy that is based off of maybe a function movement screen or an FRC drill or test. And I look at passive active range and look at their competency during this screen. I can go, okay, it's three, two, one or zero with pain. And I could be doing that stuff seamlessly within a workout and no one even knows the wiser, right? That, that just organic movement, seeing what they are, seeing how it's impacted by the people around them. Or I can just say, no, I just need to get into the weeds on this. I need to look at these, these athletes in a very comprehensive way. There's no right or wrong there, but if you're in a situation where you're building out your roster, or if you're in a situation where you, you have to uh, essentially manage a room that you know you might lose if you do a lot of time and, and try to go understand and unpack what you're dealing with, you just got to make that choice like as quickly as possible. Not necessarily stick to your guns if it's, if you get momentum or inertia, but, but also too of like, sometimes it's easier to be efficient and get it in with an actual workout or a, that first training session. No, that makes sense. Well, I think we're out of time, but this was a really great first episode. Season five is going to be intense. We're going deep. So yeah, send me an email. Listening. Send me an email. That was too, that was too complicated. I'd love to get back to you. I'll, I just send it yeah. over to me. I'll yeah, send, back, send it over. Feedback. Yeah. yeah. Appreciate it. Can you make this yeah, a little thanks. simpler? Yeah. 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 Did you? Yeah. 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 Go to Apple health and search top five health and a rando out there with an ACE certification telling you about, sorry, ACE, telling you about, you know, you should be just doing three sets of 10 because that's best forever. Yeah, that's it. Nerd. All right, buddy. <laughs> All right. I'll see you, Tim. See ya.